Welcome to the one within all. You're listening to Innerverse. This is Chance. Today, going to do a little recap of our experiences at the Gathering Mountain Festival of Magic and Lore that Haley and I just returned to from Eureka Springs. It was a really awesome time. <laughs> we have some weird stories to tell, good stuff that happened, and probably best of all was that we launched our first foray into having a vending booth at an event where you know we're out in public and people walk by and we try to sell stuff to them. <laughs> so I sold some artwork. We both created some things that we could make fast kind of near the last minute, but these things turned out really great. So we'll talk about all that. And all in all, I think it's kind of a cool thing to be wrapping up with you guys on an episode, maybe a smaller episode, but it's neat to me because I'm always so interested in hearing about people's journey and story of how they launched their, you know, whatever it is they're doing. And a lot of times that involves some sort of entrepreneurial or vending expertise that they have to learn for themselves. And now here I am doing it finally for myself or ourselves because Haley <laughs> couldn't do it without you. <laughs> and it was a blast. So uh, welcome back to the show for a, the first time in quite a while, Haley, main partner in crime. Thank you. Yeah, this weekend was pretty great. So I'm excited to talk a little bit about our experience at the Magic Festival for Interverse because I do think it was quite a valuable event and it was really interesting to meet the other vendors, to hear the workshops, which were really easy to uh, eavesdrop on from our booth because we were right behind where the talks and workshops were given, so that was really great. And then we met, of course, the people who attended the Festival of Magic and uh, came to see what it was all about, so met some great folks this weekend. Yeah, it was a cool environment. There was stuff for the kiddies and the grown-ups in that you could actually find someone to have a very deep conversation with about the principles of magic, metaphysics, consciousness, how to actually do some field work for yourself when it comes to testing out these concepts of being able to influence reality with your will, more or less. And it was a very light and bright community of people. Like I said, lots of kids, many of them dressed in Harry Potter costumes, so that was pretty cool. And there were even workshops where kids were taught how to make their own wand and how to use it. And it was really neat to see these beings with such unlimited imaginations that haven't had, you know, the cap or the cork put in that yet, actually lighting up not just their own smiles and all that, but literally lighting up the, the place with energy just by waving around their magical sticks. <laughs> you know, it wasn't Harry Potter in that there weren't sparks flying out of the ends of the wands, but if you are able to kind of see energy, which a lot of us can, and we just sort of shut it off, or a lot of us can, and we just don't talk about it, you know, you could literally see the little wavy, like, heat lines, almost like heat lines coming off the pavement that were coming off of wands and off of uh, people just all all weekend. It was like a really high, really high energy zone. And to some people who have never experienced something like that before, it might sound a little weird or wacky. And I am much more of a materialist, <laughs> I suppose, than you are, Chance. But, we debate about it all the time. Right. But um, there was even one time when uh, a woman, Leslie, who is a part of the Oh, she she's a priestess at a temple of Isis in Nevada, but then also one of the leading members of a group called the Alpha Omega Rosicrucian Order of the Golden Dawn. And I did some looking into them as a group, and I found that they aren't exactly the Golden Dawn from the turn of the 20th century if you're, you know, if you've boned up on your cult history of the last century. 
it's not the same group in that it's not like a secret society that I can tell or a sort of hidden fraternal order. Seems more like a pay-as-you-go mystery school that gives you access to really great resources. And in the in the David and Leslie, the two people that I know from the organization, maybe the only ones that kind of run the organization. I'm sure they have other people behind them, but you know they're the face of it. They're at this festival, and they had a lot of good and freely given knowledge about all kinds of topics. So I thought it seemed like quite an interesting, quite an interesting gig, I guess, to be running an online school for magic and metaphysics. Right. So, so Leslie was holding a workshop on making your own wand. And I, again, more materialist type of person. And she was showing one of the kids um, with a wand that was already activated how to do, how you would do a fire spell. And so she asked the kid who came up as a volunteer, do you feel that kind of like tingly sensation that's coming up through the ground and into your arm and into your hands? And he looked really awestruck and he, he, his eyes were wide and he said, yeah, I feel it. And she said, okay, now I want you to harness that energy and focus it over there towards the trees and cast the fire spell over towards the trees. And so um, with a big granny does this and she keeps asking, do you feel it? And he's, sa- he's going, yeah, wow, I feel it. It feels really weird. And it looked like, kind of like Chance was saying, heat waves coming off of asphalt or coming off of a really hot metal surface over his wand. You could see the energy coming off of the wand. So it was really interesting, really cool, and very uh, physically there, at least from my perspective. And Leslie was quite possibly one of the most psychic people who I've ever met in my life and I did happen to meet some of the most psychic people I've ever met in my life at this magic festival which was pretty uh small in number so that really says something about the crowd that attended yeah yeah it wasn't a huge event given that it was their first year Uh, I think the right people came it was perfect we made all the vendors were able to become very good friends with each other because there were times where there's a little bit of lull in the uh, attendee crowd and you know nothing against the festival or the organizers by the way, it's, they did a fantastic job. And like I said, I think the exact right people were there. But in those times where there's a little bit of space, we really got to know each other. And like she said, there were the most psychic people around. And as for, you know, back to the concept of seeing non-physical, well, I shouldn't say non-physical, less physical energy. I really don't even like the distinction between physical and energy or physical and spirit, matter and spirit. It's the same thing, and it's just whether or not you can see that wavelength of the light spectrum that's right. coming off of it. It's all about the spectrum and your perception of that, whether it's through you know sound or one of our uh, one of our senses. So, but that what you're describing, seeing energy that looks kind of like heat waves rising off of stuff, I see that all the time, and I'm pretty sure I always did, but trained myself to ignore it because it had no point, and then getting more, I guess, sensitive to my own internal energy flows. I started practicing trying to see it on myself, especially when I was focusing and directing it. Qigong as a a practice really helped unlock this for me. And what I find with any form of perception, it's all rooted in imagination, just like every other aspect of thought and being in reality. Like literally every, every type of thought, everything that goes on in the mind is emerging from imagination. And we all have this idea that imagination is uh, created by thought, like thoughts are a type of man, are but are actually thoughts are just a type of imagination. You, you feel me? It's we have it backwards. So if you've got the imaginary capacity to start exploring new modes of perception and you're looking for something, then you might start being able to see it. And if it takes having to kind of imagine that you're seeing it before you can see it, or imagine that you feel it, or visualize it, whatever, that actually is something that's going to give your mind a language to speak with you on those subjects with in that now that you've imagined what it might look like when you actually are sensing or perceiving the same or the real thing that will be the image that your mind gives you of it and it totally makes sense because your eyes are just a data information receptor and then your mind takes that huge amount of light and information coming in through the eyes and organizes it into whatever it is that you're seeing in your mind a 3d holographic image So if it's filtering some of that out 
and you always have filtered it out, then it, and no one else gives you much of a context for how that should look or what it should be, or you never even hear about that part of the spectrum of vision, like such as seeing energy or aura, you will start being able to see it once you start building the bridge with imagination. I hope that makes sense. But right. I, that's how and, it works for me. And I think a lot of people, like, there have been a lot of times where, you know, I feel a presence and I see that heat wave looking uh, wavering to the air and I'm like, oh, well, it's just my eyes or it's just my imagination. But you're so right. It's, it's just your imagination. Well, maybe that's just the way that you're interpreting that data that's coming in and there really is a presence in the room where the heat waves you saw around that person really it was their aura and you weren't imagining that gold or blue or whatever color light what that what you saw around that person or that animal so i think i completely agree with that and um that kind of makes me think of how the seance went that we were fortunate enough to attend <laughs> oh man well yeah i guess that was something we were going to tell you guys about that this was definitely the weirdest part of the whole experience. Should we just, I guess, start from the beginning and I'll, I'll start from before the beginning and just say, I've never attended a seance. I'm actually not a hundred percent sure that I ever would do it again, even. And we can maybe talk about our reasons for that later. But as far as an experience goes, it was definitely something that defies just pure material science. There's no afterlife or no extended consciousness type of concept because <laughs> I'll tell you, I definitely experienced some things that were, that were really there. But like, we, like I was just saying, it was coming in through my imagination, but that imagination, I'm more sure than ever is a, a form of perception. And that's one of, that's part of it. It's not just a creative mode of thought, but it's also a perceptive mode of thought. Imagination has two sides like that. And I think, getting those two things in sync, being right in the middle between perceiving and imagining is where you start to open up to what's there that's not necessarily material. And I guess like, I'll let you, why don't you describe kind of how this was set up and, and like uh, how, you know, how did it start? You have a good memory for detail. Right, okay. Um, and to preface this, I also, I've done a couple of seances whenever I was younger and my mom had a paranormal investigators come to our house. We did do small EVP ses sessions, which is a type of seance, but nothing as large or as formally a seance as this, for sure. So, We're going to have to back up after we uh, tell this story and just tell the story about your EVP experiences at your old house. Oh, gosh. <laughs> <laughs> so this particular seance started at midnight, and we all came into the room and we're given a card. Now this card asked for the name of the person you were trying to contact. Also, it was a tent, it asked for, uh, a big tent, not a room. Oh, right, it was a tent, but um, it was outdoors. So it asked for your name, the name of the person you were trying to contact, and the message you wanted to give them or uh, why you were trying to contact them. And it also had a penny on the card where you would kind of, uh, you held it between your thumb and forefinger, infused your little bit of your intention into the metal, and then we put these cards into a glass bowl. After that, we are all seated around in a, um, a circle of sorts and we're given a pendulum, which we warm, he sort of warmed us up with this pendulum. And, uh, it was, what, what would you call him? He was like a psychic performer kind of a psychic entertainer. entertainer yeah it was actually that was actually one of the sort of disjointive uh, aspects of the experience is that it seemed like he what i mean no no offense to the uh i can't remember his name but the gentleman did. who did the performance uh it seemed like he wasn't quite a believer in the phenomenon in a way or that he wasn't maybe sensitive to even what the people in the circle might have been experiencing. And I and I don't say that in a judgmental way. It's like we're all at different levels of perception and <laughs> different openness of perception. I'm sure that there are people in that circle that were seeing things with their third eye or their second sight that I wasn't seeing. I know that actually from hearing other people's reports. But that being said, uh, the theatricalness, I think what I, I guess in its defense, what I want to say is that my research into this type of topic has, has kind of pointed to the fact that when you do put in a lot of sort of ceremony and pompousness to what you're doing, it actually adds to the power of it, even if it's a little theatrical. 
But I think we are the types, most everyone in that circle, where we probably didn't need that and could have maybe t- done it in a more, I don't know, respectful, less, uh, I guess, le- like less entertainment way and more like reverent way. Right. And that was part of, you know, I, uh, approaching this circle, I tried to keep an open mind, but you know, the music to me, the mood music was a little bit corny in presentation. And Maybe so that I was wasn't, it. I wasn't feeling it out all the way. Right. So I wasn't, uh, definitely not condemning it to say, oh, nothing's going to happen, but I wasn't all the way in it either. I was just kind of observing. So we're all in this circle and he asks us to, um, visualize, which is how he kind of he kind of approached it in through visualization to help uh, call the spirits in. So we visualized a doorway behind us and the doorway was dark and um, we called upon the person who we wanted to draw into the circle. And uh, then when our doorway lit up, we imagined them coming closer and closer and um, eventually walking through the doorway. Now I know Chance and I, I wrote uh, several people down on my card to potentially call and Chance and I both had a person who was um, overlapping on our cards. So I got the sense of um, the person that we both had on our card coming up and then a friend of mine coming up at the same time and our mutual person went over to Chance's door and my person came up to my door and um, eventually entered in the room. And so, um, and you're seeing this all in your, like your mind's eye, right? With your eyes closed. Yeah. We, we had our eyes closed at this point in time. So, uh, my friend kind of comes up behind me and I'm getting this message that's like, I don't know. I'm not interested. I'm not interested, but she's still kind of standing there. And you can, it feels just like if someone, if you had your eyes closed and you're sitting in a chair and someone stepped up behind you and you could just kind of feel that someone was there. That's what it felt like. I just want to interject that. Yeah. And yeah. also, you know, I I was I let myself really go into a deep sort of meditative self-hypnagogic state on purpose to be able to open up my inner sight or visualization ability and I think that's kind of necessary. I don't think if you just close your eyes you'll see much, you know. And that's maybe part of why the mood music was used. I mean, maybe it backfired in that sense, but just in general kind of trying to relax and and sink into your your inner world. That's where you're going to be able to make this type of contact. And and yeah, uh, I'll let you continue, I guess, telling the story from, from that point on. Because you probably saw things more clearly than me. But what's cool is even though this door is behind you, you can like see what's behind you if you've practiced this type of sight. You can even practice right, this so- when you're meditating. You can actually, I know I'm <laughs> rambling for a second, but when you're meditating, try this sometime. Just try to picture the room around you and maybe even visualize yourself sitting in your meditative position from above and uh, give it some practice and you will be able to clearly like see the room around you while you have your eyes closed. It's, I won't say that you could like stop, catch a fly that was about to land on you or something, (laughs) but you know, it's something you can practice. It's an imaginary capacity. But continue, continue, sorry. (laughs) Well, that's kind of what I was starting to say is that I was kind of, picturing I could see the door behind me and if I kind of took a step back I could see myself sitting in the chair with my friend standing behind me and then the doorway that was illuminated and and opened and my friend was basically just like I don't really I'm not doing this and she left and she was kind of I could kind of sense her beyond the doorway but she wasn't a part of the circle pretty much this whole time so after we had kind of called our loved ones in and um, our Chance and I both had one person who was over with him and then my person had backed out, um, he called up a couple of volunteers to use a glass jar similar Actually, to... Actually, hold up. Before that, the pendulums came back. First, he had just had us kind of use play with the pendulums and see if we could like will them to go one direction or another. But then after we had called in spirits to the circle, he asked the spirits to basically control the pendulums and you just hold this string with a little nail on the end of it uh, as still as you could and then he would ask them to move it left to right and it would start swinging left to right and then he would say now make them start moving in a circle clockwise and before he had even like mom- like a moment before he'd even started to say it mine had already started changing direction and they were really swinging and I, I, get, I really did not try to make them move at all 
And then the wildest part was he said, all right, now make them stop. And it just, <laughs> they just stopped. And it seemed like all around the circle, people were in sync on that. So that was pretty cool. So he had people uh, come up to the middle table and all of our names were written down on an index card and they used a glass jar sort of like you would use a planchette on a Ouija board to figure out who the two, well he wanted four actually, but he wanted several people to act as the mediums to communicate with the spirits who had now entered the tent or room. Yeah, this guy does it on a volunteer basis, but the spirits volunteer you. <laughs> so yeah. just by participating in... In this seance, you were like signing up to possibly be uh, selected to be a medium. And, and so how the glass jug, jar thing worked, it was like a glass goblet style cup or like a stemmed wine glass. And it was turned upside down and there's a candle on top of it. And it's sitting on top of a table. And the people who he called up to try to help select names would hold their hands out, uh, not touching the jar, but just with their hands above the table and try to project their energy and intention for... Uh, the cup to move and it was just sliding around the table <laughs> so without being um, touched the funny thing is i kind of had this feeling that chance was going to get selected or i at least knew i felt like he maybe wanted to be but i definitely was kind of i was feeling like he was going to be selected and he had the same feeling himself not feeling i actually volunteered uh when i realized that it was like a that someone was going to have to be people are gonna have to be the mediums here I, and because I wasn't really quite sure about the sort of security and safety of the situation, I was actually mentally projecting that I volunteer and I want to do it. Like towards the spirits. Towards the spirits so that it, with, the, uh, <laughs> with the idea in mind that I have quite strong self, <laughs> I guess, uh, <laughs> self-awareness. I'm not, in my opinion, I'm not likely that something was going to like jump into me, attach to me, take over me, or any of the above possible problems that you might get when interacting with spirits or non-physical entities. And in general, I think not everybody is quite there knowing how safe and protected and free they really are to the point where not, they're almost invulnerable to that stuff. And I won't say I'm completely invulnerable, but I was feeling pretty invulnerable, so I thought, I volunteer as tribute. <laughs> and, uh, and yeah, that's what happened, right? Yeah, it is. And that's funny you say that because I, there were a lot of other people in the room. Um, so, of course, there was a a good chance you didn't get selected. But I was definitely thinking in my head, like, okay, I don't want to be the medium. I hope they don't pick my name. <laughs> and I didn't. <laughs> so we both got our way, which is hilarious. But anyway, they they picked Chance and one other woman. Yeah, and, and he uh, couldn't get them to pick anyone else, even though he wanted more. Yeah, he was like, okay, spirits, let's get let's go for two more. Nothing, nothing. Let's which go for one more. Almost nothing, reflects nothing. my intention of wanting to just be the one that takes care of it. <laughs> so it was weird. Chance and this other woman were sitting up front, and um, she's her name was Mita. Mita, that's right, that's right, and. Um, they do a visualization where they... Well, hold on. One other thing happened first. He had us take the major arcana of the tarot and spread it out on the table and then select a card, a, you know, as psychically as our, however our own personal methodology of picking a card would go. And that was kind of funny because I knew exactly what card I was going to pick as soon as I spread them out. I could see the one and I didn't really need to feel around for it. And two other people told me they knew that was the card I was going to pick up. And I picked it up and put it, placed it between my hands and I was instructed to let myself be pulled or directed to who should receive the card in the circle. And before he could finish even the first part of those instructions, I was being yanked to my left and then forward to hand the card to this girl Paris. And it was almost like if you've ever seen dowsing rods where they just sort of turn on their own uh, on a central axis, that's how I spun holding this card and that was pretty weird because I I the only other way I could describe the feeling is when I'm doing qigong exercises back to that and I will do certain exercises where I'm inhaling and creating sort of an energy ball between my hands or something and as I inhale my hands will expand with the circumference of the ball without my mind saying hands move or controlling it in any way and when I exhale, they'll automatically move back. And it's a very subjective thing, but it's like my breathing or the energy that's that I'm holding in my hands is what's moving my hands. And it took me a lot of practice to even get to the point where I, I could kind of do that. 
but that's exactly how it felt whenever I was being pulled with the card. And it was pretty cool, actually. It didn't feel like I was being controlled. I mean, I, I had to will to like, I, I chose to be taken to the person who wanted the card. It was almost like there was an invisible person who grabbed me by the hands and pulled me over there. It wasn't like I was being taken over. It was like, if that makes sense, you know, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't invasive or intrusive. It was actually just pretty cool. And there's a lot of times in the circle where it felt all of a sudden cold. And I thought that was probably, you know, a common indicator that spirit presence is happening. So Chance and this woman are sitting uh, at the front of the group and are given a visualization to just kind of get in the mode of things of being in a park and they walk over a bridge and they're asked to picture a house and they walk in the house and... Um, and the bridge is like the bridge to the other side, by the way. It, it was kind of a long visualization. Well, maybe I should tell this part because kind of, we were both in there but and you can tell what you were seeing because we're all visualizing it together, but... Uh, I'll, I'll describe kind of how that was. Like as I was coming up and passing this bridge, I actually saw in my mind's eye during this visualization several people that had like passed on from my past that I hadn't even thought about for a long time. They weren't like actively fresh on my mind and their faces were popping up there. So I thought, this is neat. And then he had us go into this house uh, that was supposed to, I guess, represent the dwelling place, like a meeting point point between us and whichever spirits wanted to communicate to someone in the circle. And inside this house, uh, I, I kind of got a very vivid, clear picture of what it looked like from the outside and what it looked like on the inside. And um, there, kind of, there was a few things that happened in there, but the first thing that happened was he had the other medium Mita look for the glass jar that contained the names and the cards from the very beginning of the ceremony where we put our messages on cards and she was supposed to sort of psychically or in this astral realm pull a card out of the jar and read the name that's on it and so she did and the name she read was Desiree and if you are a listener to the show then you know Desiree a few episodes back the astrologer she's the one throwing the gathering mountain festival but this woman, Mita, was just an attendee, did not know Desiree was in the circle or know Desiree's name. So <laughs> she, I had my eyes closed, I didn't know this, but she had apparently left to go use the restroom. And right when she had come back and sat down, Mita had said, Desiree. And she was like, what? But that seemed to be kind of all that Mita was getting as far as impressions. And from that point on, it switched to more my sort of monologue describing of what I was experiencing. And while when it was my turn to pull in a name out of the psychic jar, the name I was getting on the card in my mind's eye, it's kind of like in a dream when you try to look at something like writing or numbers and it gets all squiggly. That's what it was doing. I couldn't really see words that looked all smudged or blurry. And you know, my imaginary vision isn't that great. It's all very dark and dim. It's like going through a cave with, uh, with uh, a lighter and that's your only light. <laughs> And that's kind of how I see the things that I'm seeing. So it's not a strong sight. It's mostly impressions. And we all experience it in our own way. So it's kind of like your intuition of what you're seeing is in the, in the words and the, the pop in your mind are as important as what you might see. But anyway, the name that I saw was looked like Jan or Jen. And I couldn't figure out what it was. And it turned out later that uh, Desiree's first name is actually Gina. And that totally made sense. That was the name that I was getting the impression of on my card. So... In both instances, the person who had, who we were pulling a name out to uh, indicate who the message was going to be for, was the same person. And then I ended up in the room in a room of this house that I was exploring mentally, coming across this older this old man <laughs> wearing white T-shirt and uh, overalls and smiling really big, and he had square rimmed glasses with the gold frame. And I was describing all this and. Uh, Desiree said that pops up and says that sounds like my grandpa and then I I said he's pointing at his knee or his shin well at that point she said that's my grandpa and um, the the guide was asked Chance well is he doing anything and Desiree at this point turns to her husband and she whispers if he says 
the shindig, I'm going to pee my pants or something like that. And I'm sitting right by Desiree, and so I'm kind of able to look at Chance and hear what he's saying and look at Desiree and see what she's saying. And I was on the other saying. side of the circle. I didn't hear that. Yeah, they were on opposite side. We were on opposite sides of the circle. Um, Desiree and I were. We were on opposite sides of the circle from Chance. So um, Chance responds to the question of, is he doing anything? And he says, he's pointing at his right knee or his right shin. And Desiree just goes oh my gosh and leans forward and he was kind of dancing around like comically and she said um he's do he's talking about the shindig he always used to dance the shindig which is a type of dance yeah (laughs) and so at that point i kind of uh, i guess what what i found that made the vision more clear the message more clear was when i would ask like mentally ask questions or try to see something so i asked if it had any messages and this was maybe the weirdest part uh, when I asked if he had any messages for Desiree, I got this huge blast of emotion that was so strong it choked me up mid-sentence. And I think it probably was audible. But what was strange is that like I didn't get words in my head specifically. I just got this strong feeling of like love and pride, which I was able to translate into words and a few sentences. But it was like this wicked blast of emotion, like someone just turned cold water on in the shower while you're standing under it, but then right back off, like a second or half a second after. So it wasn't, wasn't the way you would normally feel a wave of emotion where you feel the huge wave and then it slowly subsides. It was like huge wave that I feel in my whole body and then gone as if nothing. So that was pretty weird. <laughs> and uh, I saw a few other things, but uh, I at a, at a certain point I decided I was ready to leave that space. So I, I did. And then that was kind of the end of the, the deal. And um, the weird thing is, after the seance was over, Chance found out that he and Desiree were both super distantly related, which kind of makes sense as to why he would have seen her relative as opposed to anybody else in the circle's relative, because maybe they shared some blood uh, way down the line. Yeah, I think we have a common ancestor of William the Conqueror, the guy that came and took over England at one point. So that's something that's commonly found in like paranormal or parapsychology research is that people with common bloodlines tend to have a stronger psychic bond and connection to each other. And I think Desiree and I do have actually like a weirdly strong bond and connection without having known each other that long is one of those things. You find that with certain people that you meet, you just instant kinship and connection. And that doesn't necessarily require a, a close blood link either. I mean, you and I don't have a close blood link that I know of. Or maybe we we might, actually. It's kind of a big melting pot at this point. But, uh, yeah, that was the story of the seance. Um, all in all, pretty pretty weird. And I guess to, to go back to a point I made at the beginning, why I wouldn't do that again, at least not in that same way, but probably just not at all, is because, A, in the method that we've been talking about this whole time, which is through the imagination... Any of us can make this type of contact with anybody living or dead at any time with their spirit. And it's as simple as just imagining what you'd say to them and then thinking what they would say back to you. And we do it all the time, especially when we're in a, an argument with somebody or we're in a fight with somebody. We'll think in our head while we're by ourselves, I'd say this and then they'd come back with that. And then I would be like, bam, and they would be completely wrong and I would be right. And so you have these like mind arguments with people. Well, that's exactly the same thing, but in like the black magic evil reverse way that being able to contact spirits in the positive way works. It's just sort of a imaginary link, but it's not, it's not imaginary fake. It's imaginary real because you know what that, you know that person. So even if at the very end of the day, you're just kind of mentally processing and coming up with that kind of response that they would come up with. Is it that different than the experience of connecting with the loved one? Do you not get to shine in that love and connection that you have in that time that you're thinking about them and imagining them? And so at the very least, you're honoring them by by remembering them. But in my view, I think you're really able to make contact. And so why I I would just recommend a more personal approach to mediumship or seances is that and because you don't know who's in the circle with you when you're with a group of strangers. And there did wind up being kind of a, um, 
I, someone that had to be kicked out of the festival for lack of better or for for not wanting to describe it, the situation at length and that person was at the seance and drunk and all the sensitives in the in the circle were saying that he appeared like a black hole sucking the light out of the the group and so the you know, maybe the spirits that we were contacting didn't like being around that guy or didn't want to be pulled into a group where they don't know most of the people. And it seems a little disrespectful to just, it's kind of like it, if you got a phone call at, at midnight and you're doing something and all of a sudden you got teleported back to a whole other dimension that you left a long time ago and you, you know, you got, your, you got other shit going on now. Do you think you'd be like at least maybe annoyed? Maybe not all of them do get annoyed. Maybe they're happy to see us, but everyone's different. And, it, it, you know, we didn't give them much warning. We're just like, bam, hey, here you are. <laughs> and it seems maybe not like the nicest thing to do. So, you know, teach their own. And I don't dissuade, I don't want to dissuade anyone from exploring anything or doing a seance in a way that was more respectful, perhaps, uh, or whatever. But that's just my take on it in general. And maybe it's not exactly necessary, although it is a good experiment if you want to prove to yourself that, you know, that there's something going on beyond life, which that, for that sense, I'm grateful for the experience because it was a, a big learning experience. Yeah, I definitely agree. And I think that people who do seances, it's something you just kind of have to be careful with, you know, you make sure you say, okay, it's over and you send them back to wherever they came from. That way you don't get any passengers and you don't get any tricksters because you do always hear about you know some type of entity posing as a loved one which is something that happens or posing as a uh, something they're not so in that sense it's definitely not something that I would recommend people just go blindly into with no guidance and no previous research of seances either yeah that's a good point in general in general, you want to make sure your intentions for doing anything are the right ones as well. And that if at all possible, you either remain totally fearless or when you feel fear, you immediately do your own practice, do your own work internally to transmute that fear. Because that's basically the vibration that attracts the, the dark ones, if you will. <laughs> it's just the fear and like lack of self-love, you know, the feeling that you aren't worthy or any of these things. That's what attracts entities that are vampiric in nature and would feed on it and attach to you. So if you can be in a place of, you know, supreme self-confidence, then I would say you can do anything. But when it comes to working with any form of spirits or non-physical entities, like you just said, you want to be very clear about the space that they're allowed into, when it begins, when it ends, when they have to go. Because you know, you might, it's like certain people, if you let them into your house, they're never going to leave unless you tell them, hey, you got to go now. <laughs> and with spirits, they can be more sneaky. So it, it, we have one in our house that we we, uh, we should talk about. Right. We're, so this kind of goes back to Leslie, who we mentioned earlier. And it's funny because she's the one who... Leslie um, McQuaid. Leslie McQuaid. She's the one who kind of suggested that maybe this is what it what it is. But some of you may have heard of the Russian house spirit, and I can't think of the full formal name, but they're affectionately called the Domo. And the Domo will, when not when not um, appeased with things like a little dish of butter or a little dish of cream, will cause mischief in the house by doing things like hiding your keys or, you know, misplacing objects, moving things around. And one experience that's very common in our house, which more or less, there there are certain objects where they we always put them in the same place, and we try to keep things picked up, right? So, for example... Try. Try, right. And we usually do a decent job, so things shouldn't really disappear to, to quite cr crazy places, you know? But there have been times where I lose my keys, and so I start to just clean the house. Cleaning everything, because, you know, if you eventually pick up everything, you're going to find your lost object. 
So I'm cleaning and I'm cleaning and I remember one time in spe- in particular I uh, went through the closet, went through my dresser, I uh, cleaned out the room and I started to vacuum the house because I thought, well, if I vacuum, there's no possible way that I'll miss it if it's on the floor. So I vacuum the bedroom, I go out to the hall and finish the living room, still no sign of my keys, shut off the vacuum, walk back into the bedroom and my keys are laying in the middle of the floor that I just vacuumed. <laughs> vacuum tracks on the floor in this spot so clearly I'm not crazy clearly I did vacuum but the keys are right there and this happened to me um, again with a I remember it was a business card of, of some sort that I was looking for and I uh, cleaned off my dresser I dusted I cleaned out uh, because I thought maybe I'd set it on a table or a dresser cleaned off all the tables and I went back into again it was the bedroom and the card was sitting square on the middle of the dresser I had just dusted <laughs> so it was very y'all know this happens to you too right I, I'm sure I'm sure so this is called the domo and uh, now whenever this happens which it, it did right when we got home actually we just uh we just say oh domo and uh <laughs> well well so think about it like this spirits are like people because people are spirits so <laughs> This type of a being that maybe you can't interact with physically, but could share the same energy space with you and does. And it's a think about it this way. I'm going to I always back up and want to give extra explanations. But this I feel like is relevant. Uh, Energy is consciousness and energy like water fills up the container that it's in. It takes the form and shape of its container. So in a way, the house itself, a house has a consciousness and a spirit to it. And that's what the domo could be, maybe, something like that. And just like any spirit or person, it wants appreciation, wants to be recognized, wants to be loved, and it's not a bad spirit. It's more neutral, and it's more really a reflection of you, actually, the spirit of the place that you dwell in. Of course, how could it not be? So we want to make friends with our little domo, we decided. (laughs) And (laughs) yesterday, when we had gotten back from the festival, we had been talking about him and to him, and we started hearing all these knocks in the walls, and we're like, oh, cool, the, the domo hears us, and hopefully wants to be our friend back, and maybe that's all it ever wanted, because it never did anything heinous. It always gave stuff back. But what happened was, Haley was looking for... I, I was unpacking my stuff, right? And I took my toothpaste, my toothbrush, and my deodorant out of my suitcase, and took it in the bathroom, and set it on the counter. And I walked out of the room. And then Haley walked out of the room behind me one minute later and said, hey, do you know where the toothpaste is? And I go, I just set it on the counter in the bathroom. She goes, that's and I, weird. And I, I said, I, I know you did because I saw him bring it into the bathroom. I saw him bring all of those items into the bathroom. <laughs> right. So <laughs> but then it was we, no longer there. So we walk back in the bathroom and look, it's not there. Walk back into the living room, just kind of bewildered, looking around. And we go, uh, Domo, did you do that? <laughs> And we both got this chill rush of goosebumps on the skin, you know, tingly feeling, which that always indicates magic, by the way, just so you know. If you ever feel that, it's like, it's a a sensory mechanism. You're being alerted to something. Pay attention. And this was before we heard the knocking, because when we got home, um, a little backstory to interject, my little sister was watching the house and actually had my mom um, come pick her up at one point because she had been frightened by... um, random knocks that were happening in the house and she had even tried it was coming from inside the wall she claimed which we've had a roommate or two complain about this before and she said that she even knocked on the wall and it knocked three times in response yeah i've done that with it too it definitely happens i've also (laughs) had this experience so she had heard the knocking and whenever we got home we said hey if there's a spirit in this house can you knock And nothing happened. And we were like, well, maybe it was the Domo. And then it hit the toothpaste. Yeah. And then it hit the toothpaste. And so after this, and we get, we get the chills and we get the goosebumps and we're asking, Hey Domo, did you do this? We, uh, we walk back into the bedroom. We hear some knocks and then Haley walks back into the living room and finds the toothpaste in the living room. On this, on one of the tables, on one of the little, uh, uh, side tables by our couch. So at the very I know you guys might think it's possible that maybe she absentmindedly moved it over there. And I'm not even going to deny that. But I think that sort of spirits or, or, or forces can act through us in our unconscious or absent-minded moments. And you, because it's all you, it's all self. So like, even if you trick yourself into forgetting where you just moved something, 
and then you find it and have like a little moment that feels like a synchronicity uh that's i feel like that's just as valid as if it like falls through a dimensional hole and comes out the other side somewhere else in the house or a little invisible guy grabs it and runs off with it while you aren't looking uh, whatever i don't care the point is the experience and the the synchronicity and it uh, it is subjective but uh, the the beautiful thing about the whole mystery of paranormal phenomenon is it's always right in the middle between you can't prove it uh, but it seems real. <laughs> right. And I did say that. I was looking at Chance and I said, you know, maybe I brought it in here. Maybe I, because like I said, I'm much more of a materialist and I always try to explain things. And I've noticed, especially with any paranormal experience I have, it seems like um, over time I convince myself that it was other things and convince myself that it wasn't true. But uh, in the moment and the closer I am to that event, the more I'm like, wow, something unexplainable really, really did happen. So, but I did say, you know, maybe I picked it up out of the bathroom, carried it out here absentmindedly, or maybe you set everything else down but this and carried no, it. No, I know that I set it down, though, where I did. I don't know. To, we, we, we don't have to beat so, this up anymore unless you have more to say about it because we should talk more about the Magic Festival. So, going to with what Chance is saying, you know, I do try to explain things the the rational way, and I think a lot of times that is the case, but Chance has got me hooked on this Mysterious Universe podcast recently, and they've been talking about how uh, different entities kind of can latch on to people, and these energetic parasites that so many people have that can manifest through things like alcohol addiction to where maybe that spirit before was a spirit that was really addicted to alcohol, and then when it died, um, it kind of became this um, parasite that would inhabit the the unconscious bodies of other people and would encourage them to drink because that's what it liked to do. So maybe someone who is developing an alcohol problem, it would say, oh, well, your aura is already weakened from this alcohol, so let me just hop in here and take over and I can enjoy my vice as well. So I would think that even on a smaller scale, maybe that's true of like prankster spirits and they whenever your kind your mind's kind of on autopilot and you're not really you know paying attention they could influence you to hide something from yourself in a way which yeah. is kind of funny to think about magic really likes to come in to the margins of your sight like it likes to happen around the periphery of your vision not directly where you're looking and so one of the ways that you can actually practice like seeing energy or seeing auras for example is to whatever, whenever you're looking at the thing that you want to see the energy of or the person, kind of let your eyes and your gaze defocus. Defocalizing your gaze just like you would with one of those magic eye puzzles. And it's because you kind of are relaxing but also paying attention at the same time that allows stuff to come through. Just like if you had a camera lens and there was a thing in the foreground that was so close that it was literally invisible, but you changed your focus and all of a sudden it was sharply in focus with the lens, you know? That's what you can do with your sight. But you should tell the story about the EVP. I mean, we could go on about this subject forever because I mean, I, I'm not even I'm not even gonna go there talking about what alcohol does to a person. Oh, uh, right, aura. right. <laughs> you know what, <laughs> fuck it, I'm going there just real quick. This is important information. Your spirit, your, your consciousness, it just like water, it's connected to water. It, it it takes the shape of its container, but the container, the, the vessel that's carrying it is the water in your body. That's why every cell's got water. And when you're diluting the water in your cells with heavy doses of alcohol and you get to the point of blackout drunk, many of us have experienced it. What that, why are you blacked out? Why can't, why is it like everything's off now? You're letting go of the reins entirely. Exactly. And anything else can take those reins. Exactly. Because your you, literally your vibration can no longer inhabit the cells of that body and now it's just running on programs or on other things that hop on and take over for a while and if and, your body's filled with poison what goes in is going to be something that can live off of that and it's not going to be a light being let me just say that exactly and i i witnessed it with people that were drunk at this festival we were at not that mm -hmm. there were like a ton of drunk people it was basically the people that got kicked out and it was like two people and all, all the love to them as souls, you know, but it, it was a lesson for all of us to see, just like anyone that's sort of in self-destructive path, why maybe we don't want to do that. And 
you know, st- also a lesson to us to stand our ground and not let certain people be around if they're not going to follow basic decency rules. <laughs> okay, so talk about EVPs, Haley. We're we're so, fucking fifty minutes into this bitch. Fifty? Uh, yeah. How? How <laughs> this was going to be a thirty minute. This was going to be a thirty <laughs> minute thing. Okay. Okay. So I think that I could really, and I think maybe if you're interested in hearing about it, we should really just do an episode where I just tell the whole paranormal backstory because there's so much fabric and so many threads that weave into this tapestry of experiences that I've had since I was like a a very young child. Oh, Um, great. We'll just talk for two hours. (laughs) (laughs) I would have to go so far back for that. But long, long story short, um, I've always kind of had things happening that were not explainable. And I never have been the type of person to say... I believe in ghosts until even the past Which is ridiculous because you've been levitated out of your bed by by fairies. Well, before. I didn't know what it was and I didn't know, <laughs> you know, I I really thought I was crazy. I went to several um psychiatrists and had evaluations done just to get second and third opinions because I was convinced that I had some type of you know, serious mental disturbance that would cause me to hallucinate such defined experiences this in my life. This girl was getting picked up in her sleep, held in the air, and then thrown back down That's when she a, woke up. I'm not telling that story. That's for another time, but I will, I will. But basically, we had paranormal investigators come to the house whenever things, um, whenever I was a kind of a young uh, preteen and teenager, activity really picked up, which is very Normal. common. Yeah. yeah, that's very common. But it was to the point where it was really scaring my whole family. So we had investigators <laughs> come out to the house. Jane's and, about that age now, your sister. Yep, yep. And they've sure enough been having a little bit more. You know, when she came over here to the house, for example, she said she was having some things happen that were scaring her. So there's definitely a pattern that exists. But one of our EVP sessions in particular, um, well... EVP, electronic voice phenomenon. Right, right. So it's where you have a recorder and you're asking the spirit questions. There's one in particular which I can't even and, find. And then audio comes through in the recording that you couldn't hear with your ears. Potentially, right. Potentially. Um, so I will actually insert this electronic voice phenomenon after I kind of give the story of what happened. And you can hear it for yourself. But to me, uh, it's the most clear EVP I've ever heard because, you know, you watch those ghost hunting shows and it's like and they're all like oh he said he was gonna kill us and you're like what the? i didn't even hear anything in that so <laughs> i haven't heard the recording either i've just heard the story so i'm excited i'm gonna put it in the episode for sure well what happened is it was um a man and a woman who were in the room they were two two of the investigators and they had the recorder with them now my siblings and the animals and i had all been removed from the house in order to prevent any interference the uh they shut off power and made sure all electronics were shut off as well to help avoid interference and uh, nothing was happening when they first got there nothing was going on and so my mom said well all of this seems to kind of center around our daughter Haley and the investigators said well okay go on and bring her to the house so they came and picked me up um, and brought me out and as soon as I got there their equipment started failing you know batteries that were fully charged just the equipment stopped working. There, uh, they couldn't turn things on. Their flashlights weren't wouldn't work. Stuff like that. You're a real firecracker. So <laughs> I can only imagine as a, like a teenager. So I get I get there and I'm sitting in the kitchen at this point in time, and there are two separate EVP sessions going on in the house. And my only job was to sit there and be as quiet as possible. So one of these EVP sessions, uh, were hap- it was happening in my parents' bedroom. And a man and a woman both sitting in the room. And they said, if there's anybody in here, make a sound to let us know you're here. Maybe maybe give us a knock. And sure as spit, you hear um, this huge bang come from inside the wall. And so loud, in fact, their microphone only picked up this little tap because it made the audio clip because it was so loud. And so they kind of laugh nervously, and the guy goes, I hope that was the dog. And the woman says, she took both the dogs, referencing the fact that my mom took both the dogs out of town so they wouldn't be making noise. And when you play back this audio, you hear this female voice say, I did it. 
And the one of the main things that I had been experiencing was the spirit of a little girl who had been following me for years. Um, I would see her in the hallway. I would see her throughout the house. I would hear her voice. Um, my mom, there was also an adult woman who was presumably her mother who I encountered a few times, but mostly my mother heard. Uh, and my mother was huge skeptic for all of her life up and through her 20s up into her early 30s whenever she finally was um getting freaked out by all of this stuff happening in my preteen years but even the things I told her would happen as a child and her own experience as a child she would always brush off and you know uh put off to something else but my mother had heard a a woman's voice over the baby monitor which easily catches interference but it said you have a very beautiful baby Clear as day. And to, and for the record, my parents um, don't live in the city. They are several miles away from... Um, it's about 15 minutes to the nearest town with, like, a Walmart or anything, like, big like that. But their town, uh, they're several miles out of um, the small town they live in. And the closest my neighbor is, like, a half a mile away. So although baby monitors do tend to catch interference, that's so specific and so applicable and it was so clear that it didn't seem, it didn't seem like interference, obviously. <laughs> Creepy. Uh, but there was more EVP, and even two of the ghost hunters came uh, running out of one of the back rooms during a session, claiming that they saw, uh, they, they were not given a lot of information before this, by the way, because we didn't want to influence their data, so we didn't really tell them the things that we had seen. They didn't know about the little girl, but they came running out of the back room saying that they saw a little girl crawl out of the closet as clear as day, and wow. they wouldn't go back in. Yeah. And then they wouldn't research your house anymore. No, they actually did ask to come back. They came back two more times, and uh, once was even a different group of people from the same um, or organization, right, who came back to, to get some data. Wow. Well... What a great set of completely off-topic things we did there. <laughs> <laughs> a little more about the Magic Festival, maybe, just because that was so fun. You know, we danced around a fire, we played drums, we sang songs together, we met lots of beautiful, wonderful people. You and I sold some artwork. I had about 20 posters that I had put together, and you made a bunch of awesome hemp-wrapped bracelets and necklaces that are just gorgeous. You can see them on our Instagram feed. And I made some neat little crystal bracelets because if you know me in person, I'm always wearing a bunch of crystal bead bracelets because I think I like it's the best way to get that crystal magic into your blood. <laughs> and I don't know, I feel pretty good. So <laughs> maybe it's working, but... Even got some belly dancing lessons from some belly dancers that were there too. So that was fun. Yeah. <laughs> we ate corn on the cob. <laughs> we, <laughs> yeah, we, we made... A small amount of profit so we didn't even we didn't even lose money on it usually you go to festivals you lose money right so y'all should uh, start vending that's the trick to go to more fun things yeah definitely but I'm sure a lot of you already are or are working on it <laughs> and we're looking forward to doing more ourselves including the metaphysical fair in November so we'll have to talk more about that um, on a later episode yeah last episode we talked to Joey Smith and he is one of the guys running the Springfield, Missouri Metaphysical Fair, and that's like November 3rd or 4th, really early in the month, but if you're a Springfield local, go to that. You'll see us there. I believe it was even the second, potentially. And you can even see our trinkets and treasures and pieces of art, and we'll share our heart with you. We love you. And thanks for listening. This yeah, thanks for listening. This has been a great episode after a great weekend, so it was really uh, nice to record it for if not your own entertainment, for our entertainment later down the road. Well, it's also my psychological well-being. I freak out if I don't get a podcast out once a week. <laughs> and, oh, well, I, I maybe, I, I guess I could say this too. I'm going to th throw in, after we're done talking here, a short little conversation I had with Renee Johanna, who was a guest several episodes back. She and I did a live podcast at the event. The original live podcast that I was talking about so much that I was going to do with, uh, it was actually going to be with David and Leslie, that kind of fell through due to lack of, I guess, audience and lack of energy and lack of right timing. I don't know. It just wasn't, I, I'm not bitter about it. It just wasn't going to happen. And I was like, okay, I'm not going to try to force it to happen. And it was one of those days where you, 
you have lots of podcast worthy conversations, but there's no mics out. The stars <laughs> story, just didn't align. Story of my life. But Renee, she had a presentation right at the beginning of the festival. She was like kind of the opening performer, so to speak. And she wanted to have someone to talk to up there. And I was like, well, I'll film it and I'll record it and we'll we'll do it like a little mini live podcast. That way I can warm up before my real live podcast later. And as it turns out, this was my real life podcast. And we had a good little chat about what she does and sort of even more sort of uh, paranormal spirit contact type stories too, actually, because so it kind of fits in with what we were talking about here. And yeah, uh, I guess that that's what we'll do. I'll transition over to that. And there we go. Just try not to flail my arms. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you guys ready? Mm-hmm. All right, guys, we are starting our very first presentation of the festival. Opening our magical ceremonies is Renee Johanna, a good friend of mine and a spiritual life coach, intuitive counselor, and excellent author of the book Welcome to Awakening. And I can say personally that I've read the book and it gave me a lot of great food for thought and ammunition for dealing with difficult situations in life. And I think we can all probably use a little bit of that and some inspiration. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Renee. How's it going? Great. Thank you. Thank you for introducing me and put in a plug for what you're doing here. Oh, yeah. Yes, of course. I'm Chance Garten. I am the host of Interverse Podcast. And you can catch Renee on that show a few episodes back. And we had a really fun conversation, probably more laughs than almost any episode <laughs> I've ever had, including with some of my own close personal friends. So if that doesn't give you an indication of Renee's intuitive ability to connect and just make life more fun, I don't know what does. Thank you. That is really what I'm all about is having fun. Tell us and about yeah, tell us about some of the uh, things you do for clients and and everything. Well, like lately I've been calling myself a clairvoyant coach because it really does describe what I do for people. I knew I was coaching them all my life. I I knew I could read people even though I had no words to describe that I didn't know. But um, then I became certified like 10 years ago. And just to please other people, to va have the valid credentials, I guess. But I had no idea I was clairvoyant until my late 30s when my grandma died six months later, came into my dreams, started telling me everything about me. I thought this entire process in my life was a punishment from a past life <laughs> and I was cursed because what I was seeing and feeling and sensing from people was not anything that anyone was comfortable with nor could they explain to me why I was so different so I learned to shut it down very quickly tell people what they wanted to hear I was a pro at it master of disguises but um it wasn't until my um, youngest son started diving into addiction <laughs> and I was going down faster than he was. And that's when my grandma came through my dreams and woke me up and literally told me everything of why I was here. And then I took 10 years to like turn it around and focus on what might be right instead of what might be wrong. And I still talk to her. I go through meditation now because I don't like waiting for dreams. But, um, there's definitely something out there that's bigger than anything that we have even dreamt of here. So I'm finally glad that people are getting on the weirdo train with me. <laughs> and I'm not so alone anymore. Absolutely. Well, you're probably in good company here at this festival, the Gathering Mountain being basically all about magic and metaphysics. I think a lot of us that actually pay attention in our lives, especially in difficult situations uh, or lost loved ones, uh, we can always see that sort of synchronistic silver lining in things where maybe the message that you feel you're getting from the other side is subjective to just your own situation and settings, but that doesn't make you any less inspired and uh, reinvigorated in life whenever you start taking those synchronicities seriously. Mm -hmm. I know I personally 
many people that I've known that have passed away have made clear attempts to communicate back with me or and sometimes just popping in my head but in other times uh, very you could call it like positive poltergeist activity <laughs> something like that what do you think I think it's all absolutely happening and possible I know the dream world let's start there with the synchronicities because I understood dreams better than my daytime like I was lost in the human experience but the dream world made perfect sense to me I was interpreting dreams when I was little I didn't I just it made sense so when I started getting the realization I think I was about seven that I was having dreams before it was happening in the real world and I then I started telling people my dreams to make sure I had a witness and I, my family, they knew I was special, they called me, but um, for me, I felt uncomfortable in my own skin because I felt absolutely everybody, it was empathic anguish, is what I write about in my book because I felt everybody to the core and I didn't understand it, I didn't know where they stopped and I started and the dream world made sense and then when I started realizing the dream world signs and symbols, when you apply them to consciousness, it absolutely means the same thing. And I might be the pers first person that came up with that. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> well, it's often been said that the greatest thought has already come before us. And unfortunately, there are thinkers that have made that connection to the unconscious realm and in dreams being not really any different than the conscious waking world other than the speed that things move at. You know, actually though, since we last spoke, my grandma has passed away and it was a very you know wasting and debilitating situation for her very hard to watch someone who used to be so strong kind of just disappear into nothingness but on the subject of dreams she has come to many of my family members in their dreams and actually on the subject of predictive dreams i have a very clear memory of being probably about a 10 year old child and I was on my way home from my grandma's house and she was riding with me and my parents because she was going to be like babysitting me the next day. And in the car, I had a dream about getting home and going in and then seeing my grandma sitting on the couch and asking me for a, a blanket because she was already cold. And then we got to the house, my parents woke me up, I go inside, and then not two minutes after arriving, the exact thing that I just dreamed happened beat for beat and I was yeah. completely... <laughs> I guess amazed by that it's one of the few sort of drastically predictive dreams that i can remember but you know i'm sure we're having them all the time all the time so anyway i guess we're we are uh, we're alike in both having grandmothers that are very interested in our positive development still and uh, yeah. part of our experience just not you know not gone even though they're no longer in their bodies possibly more powerful like obi-wan kenobi in Star Absolutely. Wars, <laughs> more powerful than we could ever imagine. Yeah. That's what I always say is I have, and I know it sounds weird, but I have a much better relationship with the dead people than the alive people because <laughs> they're happier. You get the best of them. They really know how to work the magic. And everybody here is so lost and confused and caught up in the human details. And I was never that person, so I understand that world better. Several of my family members have said the same thing. Renee just gets the dead people better. <laughs> and it's true. Because most people here are not exactly living their truth. They're not really connected to all that's loving and kind. So um, I do like that realm better. I feel much comfortable there. And um, I see no reason why people aren't connecting all the time. And seriously, I think... That's why we connected, is the grandma thing, seriously. <laughs> she was setting it up before. Yeah. So all you have to do, and are you bummed that you haven't got a dream yet? I, I, I don't know if I've had a dream or not. I might have. <laughs> the thing, that's what I was going to tell you, is you are um, you're so awake and aware that you can communicate without the dream world. That's how I that's, feel, too. <laughs> that's you. So you're going to get, if you haven't already, nonstop communication. You'll be the, and I think I told you this before, you'll be the strongest member in your family to be the channel because you're the closest to the truth. 
and sense, and they, they'll, they'll use you. They'll use, I love it. Because they'll always bring the most amazing messages. I call it leftover vibration. I don't care really what people call it anymore, but I get to have coffee with my grandma whenever I want, and she's been gone like 15 years. So call me crazy. I, I want people to latch on to this and know that, and that's a lot of what I wrote in my book, Welcome to Awakening, is there's a, there's a process of waking up and knowing yourself and kind of releasing all the stuff that doesn't work for you anymore. That takes some time. And people want to push themselves into involvement right away and the wake up and, okay, now what? Let's hurry through this. But you have to release so much um, negative that's blocked your energy all this time. So when people want to connect to their loved ones, the first thing I tell them is, you need to learn how to love yourself so much that you're going to get sick of yourself. Because <laughs> that's where they live. They love you so much and they never get sick of you. And that's the thing is, all they want is to live through your eyes, feel the energy of love and fun and and have that experience with you. And you really can absorb them. That's what I experienced as each loved one has passed. I have found myself absorbing parts of their, parts of their personality that I adored. And it starts to become me. Like I started getting more comfortable with strangers. That was my dad, that was never me. So um, I, I love this process, I really do. I dig the dead. <laughs> Well, there's a lot I could say about about it. I guess I'll start with an anecdote about my one more anecdote about my grandmother. About she was uh, unconscious for a day or two before she passed, but about eight minutes before she actually did pass, the power went out in her entire town. Yes. And then after after she was gone, it came back on. That happens. So that's another. That's a very obvious uh, synchronicity. Mm -hmm. You can call it a coincidence if you want, but there is a definite energy to our spirits that goes in and out of the body, for sure, it seems like. And as far as, you know, liking the dead more, I often look at the world that we're in, actually, as more like, the, you know, because everything is so obviously backwards from, I guess, cultural morality, and um, you know priorities to the fact that our eyes literally flip the, the thing that we're seeing upside down, our brain does, because what we're actually seeing is upside down of what we're looking at, <laughs> oddly enough. It, and because everyone is actually so terrified of this threshold they call death that they're almost not living, I actually think this is the world of the dead. And that the other side where you're no longer separate from the infinite loving truth that you are radiating from is where you're actually that's more like life and that spirit of that and that energy of that place is what animates your vehicle here which is just like you know matter so that's kind of my take on it actually it may be a little extreme but it's a good take it everything seems upside down so yeah. might as well flip it the really notion is. that we're actually even living you know yeah. whenever we are in any way separate from the the truth of our infinite value and potential as a being, then that is a form of, I guess, like death or separation from from your higher, truer self, I mm -hmm. guess. And it is. I do love that you always point people to their higher self by just being joyful and uh, fearless around them, and I'm glad that you went through the process of deprogramming. I think I, I might be getting one. onto a ramble here, but, you know, everything that's physical in our bodies that might be an ailment or that is some characterological possible flaw or that we see as a flaw in ourselves, or something we want to change it's all connected to thought thought is a foundation and your imagination beyond thought is the foundation of everything that you ever experience or manifest in your body and uh, the voices in our head that give us the most trouble in my, in my opinion are the imaginary voices that we create uh, as the care that what we imagine other people to be thinking about us or, or observing about us. And I think it happens when we're kids, we first realize that not only do we see the world, but the world sees us back. And at that point, you get a fictional uh, character that starts living in your head that's this critic 
mm -hmm. of everything about you is mm -hmm. always, you know, basically afraid that you're going to break the rules. Yeah. So, you know, not that you shouldn't uphold social harmony in your behavior, of course, and do the right thing, but you should just trust yourself to do that and not be constantly belittling yourself. And if you hear that voice in your head, you should recognize it as an artificial intelligence that's taken root in your consciousness. That's, they call it, in psychology, it's the super ego. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's not, and I think that's something you need to be very clear on because so much of spiritual teaching involves kind of the concept of kill the ego. But that's also, you know, that's the embodiment of who you are in this life. And I think the ego is also very connected to your body all the problems that you have egoically tend to be connected to physical blockages in the body. Right. So, yeah, what do you think? Uh, heal the ego instead of kill the ego. That's what <laughs> I'm trying to tell people. I like that. I'm going to add that to my flyers. <laughs> <laughs> um, and a lot of what I write about my book is exactly that. It's releasing the need to please and really care about what other people think because you ultimately are your own worst critic, your own worst judge, your own worst enemy, when you can tame and manage that um, critical voice that tends to take over and berate us and tell us we're not doing enough, um, that's, that's when you're home free, is you really start talking yourself through this process and having your back no matter what. That's what they always say, be your own best friend, that's that process. I wrote um, a lot of strategies in my book of how to love yourself and heal yourself through anything. And I got to be the first of the people to prove it to myself. And I know for a fact it absolutely works. So I'm just excited to be here, excited to meet people and get this show on the road. Yeah, me too. I'm actually really grateful that you asked me to talk to you during your presentation just in case you might be alone since we're opening here although we're not alone we're surrounded by many magical friends and it's that's a great opening it's a great opening but i'm also here doing this is my very first time doing what you might call a live podcast in front of an audience so i have one tomorrow night that has been scheduled but this is sort of like a nice warm-up for me so that whenever it's impromptu. i impromptu yeah impromptu and you know i think I like to uh, I like to be aware of how much more I do love myself than I used to because of the fact that I can walk into this type of a thing for the first time and feel confident and just do it and know that whatever happens is gonna be the right thing that happened and I should just do my best and all those like and have fun you know we we are sort of indoctrinated to think oh it's natural to get anxious and nervous and fearful about things well yeah I guess that's part of nature and that I mean animals feel fear as well. But you are completely in command of every part of your mental and physical processes. And the more you start paying attention to them and choosing and it, intending and doing practices if necessary, like meditation, to just sort of move stuff out of the way until you can finally, until it's finally light enough for you to grab hold of and can command, you know, that's what your consciousness is. It's sort of like the control switch for, for everything. So if you are feeling anxiety or fear welling up, just go find the root of that. And if for some reason you're really convinced that that root is unchoppable or unstoppable and you really want to continue having the story about yourself okay. that I get anxious before I'm in front of people or, uh, you know, I'm nervous about X, Y, or Z, you can do that and that's fine. And you'll keep learning from that. But you can also just sort of flip the switch yep. and be done with it if you want. Yep. True that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that's probably about all I have. I have some flyers here if anybody's interested. I wrote down some ultimate strategies about um, that I pretty much summarized from my book. And some discounts off readings. You can get my book on Amazon, reneejohanna.com. Um, email me, text me, call me, whatever, 623-236-5986. Thank you. Thanks. Well, let's keep it going. We have more people coming in. Oh, boy. Yeah, we still have some time. Hey, guys. Welcome. How's it going? I'm just having a chat here with a psychic intuitive author named Renee. Joanna. Hi. We were just talking a little bit about her story, but um, maybe... 
we can sort of circle back around and, and say what kind of things you do for clients and what you know what your work consists of. Okay. Hi, welcome. I call myself a clairvoyant coach. Have you ever heard of that before? Really? Because I made it up. <laughs> really? Yeah. That's cool. Eureka's down with the weirdos. Yeah, with my kind of people. Um, but I, it really does clearly define who I am and what I do because I started out life coaching. But I had no idea I was clairvoyant. That's what made me such a good coach was I was reading people. I read their entire life in 10 minutes. So um, I always tell them you'll get 30 years of therapy with me in 30 minutes. I had no idea that that was true. It was because of the clairvoyant side. And it really was my um, grandma. After she died, she came through my dreams and told me everything. And that's how I walked into it. So then I had to convince myself I wasn't crazy. Yeah. <laughs> Crazier. Nice job. <laughs> so now I'm on tour and out promoting and bugging you. Yeah, well, <laughs> we have no problem with it. That's what we're here for. She's well, there. have fun. Tell them about your book. She, I've read the book. It's I have awesome. yeah. my book here. Plenty of copies. I'll be here all weekend doing um, personal readings right there. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.